Welcome to Season 5 of She Ventures. I am your host, Doria Lavanino. She Ventures is a podcast about women and their work and life pivots. I believe in the power of storytelling. I also believe that if you change one woman's life, you start to change a family or a community. Our mission is to elevate the diverse stories of everyday women in their work. One promise, no mansplaining ever. Sit back, listen, and hit subscribe. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us at sheventurespodcast.com. Today's guest is an example of a woman with multiple passions, racial equity and inclusion, reducing the racial wealth gap, and women's health. Her pivot is in her approach from 20 years of experience in development and fundraising to today. This woman is now the CEO of Ria Ventures, a fund that raised $44 million dollars and if that number is wrong, she will correct me, to transform the U.S. market vis-a-vis women's health through impact investing, something that is so needed. I think we would all agree. She is the founder of the Racial Equity Asset Lab, The Real, an impact investing venture working to shift capital to address the persistent race wealth gap. And we all know about that and The number that comes to mind for me is in terms of venture capital, women of color raising 0.5%, which is a very low number, and women overall 2%. Everything she's done professionally is for the betterment of women of color and women and minorities. Erica Seth Davies, welcome to She Ventures. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I always like to start with a little about your origin story, where you grew up, and if there's either a person or a memory that comes to mind when you reflect upon your childhood? Let's see. So um, my origin story starts in Baltimore City. I was born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland, to parents who also were from Baltimore. And I have an older sister. So that is my origins. Um, And I can say that in terms of the work that I do, it is deeply tied to, I think, the lessons and the, the messages that were on repeat in my own household um, from my parents. Uh, so it was partly listening to them, but also watching them as well. So my mother used to always tell us that to whom much is given, much is required. And she was a volunteer. She was in a sorority. She was active in our church. She tithed regularly. She gave uh, resources to family members to, to go to college. And so many things that I didn't know at a young age that were happening from her, her generosity and her spirit of to whom much is given, much is required. My dad was very much, he's an engineer. He's a software engineer and is very focused on step two. He always says, you know, you got to think through uh, to step two, three, four, or like subsequent steps. And his position was always, you know, it's perfectly fine to listen to what people say, but you have to watch what people do because that tells you who they are. And that was advice that I think I didn't fully comprehend until later in life, but it's something that he said over and over again. And that also impacted me um, over time because as I was watching, you know, different organizations say that their intentions were to do a thing, but then I watched how, you know, decisions were made and who was part of the decision making, it became increasingly evident that that's not actually what these things are set up to do, right? Like these institutions are decision pathways were were designed to do. And so over time, those things have just, you know, they sat with me um, and I think shaped significantly my view of the world, how I um, attempt to to move and interact uh, with folks in the the world and the work that I try to try to bring forward. That's so eloquently stated because on the one hand, you have your, your mother who is philanthropic and very much about paying it forward and ensuring that she can help members in, in her community. And then at the same time, I think about your father and I think about the difference between, in terms of entrepreneurship anyway, right? 
these so-called visionaries who really don't know how to do the step-by-step. And the step-by-step is life. And also, lastly, like the thing that you said, and this was a really hard one for me to learn, is look at people's actions, not what they say, because there are so many people that can talk a good talk. And yes, that one was a hard one for me to follow. <laughs> yeah, on many levels, right? Like personal, right. professional yes. impact, so many levels so um, many. that that is a just a truism and um, something that actually shapes the framework of, of the Racial Equity Asset Lab, right? Like it gives gives an opportunity to make a statement, but then it kind of follows through and what are you doing to honor that? I can't wait to delve into that because I really wanted to go deeply into that. I wanted to talk a little bit about earlier in your career, only because She Ventures is about pivots also. So I know that you, you spent a lot of time in fundraising. How did that work start and evolve over time? Sure. Um, It started very early in my career and probably at the time earlier than most people would get into fundraising. So I was about 22, maybe 23, when I was hired by a community-based organization that was in need of a, a grant writer. And I had never done that before, but was an English major. So I think the assumption was I could write at the very least and was hired entry level and was given a mentor and told to figure out how to write proposals to, to raise funds for this organization. I, you know, just sort of jumped right in. And two things were happening, or two things that I came to understand. One, that this was an empowerment zone as part of the empowerment zones, which like in the early mid 90s, um, were at least $100 million grants that were given out to different cities. So I was working in one of the empowerment zones. And the whole purpose of the one that I was working in was actually to, one, make sure the tax credits and all that kind of stuff were, were happening. But it was also part of welfare to work. Okay. Uh, this this era under the, the Clinton administration. And so you had a lot of people that were being pushed off of the welfare rolls. And what struck me was the commitment of the organization and its leadership, right? It was represented in the leadership on the board and in the way that we did our work. It was tied to people who, for whom this was an actual lived experience. So the community was deeply involved in the organization what I was hearing to inform my work was directly from people who needed whatever services or who needed whatever programs we were going to design. And that really just stayed with me and struck me um, because, again, it was self-determination, right? Um, and even within a system that was imposing certain policies on the community. And so one of the, the first successful grant that I wrote was for what was called an Individual Development Account, IDA, uh, program that would match dollar for dollar um, in savings, um, what people would save uh, as they were shifting into these these programs. And it was so simple, right? <laughs> it was so simple. And it was, you know, when we were talking to people about, well, how do you save? They were like, I can't save. I have to, right? <laughs> and, you know, it struck me as like the same things that would keep any, you know, white collar worker or anybody in their job, which is the ability to have benefits, right? Like save for retirement or save for whatever. Why wouldn't that apply here? So anyway, it was, long story short, it shaped how I approach fundraising and it shaped my understanding of stakeholder engagement and community involvement and what it means to, because I was also seeing this at the same time, developers doing work in the neighborhood, saying that they were having community engagement and really they were just giving the appearance of, right? Like, we'll have this meeting, but we'll design what we want to design anyway. There are a few things that really struck me about what you said. One, you can be an English major and get into work that is going to interest you because it, really, I think that that's a real fear that some people have is, well, what am I going to do with my major? There's so much you can do with an English major. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah, like communication is key. And to your point about the community development, I saw this in Brooklyn when Barclays Arena was created and eminent domain was put upon the neighborhood. And I I was not like super involved, but I do remember there were certain community milestones that they needed to meet in terms of affordable housing. And my sense is that, and I would really have to fact check this, but I don't think that they were met in the way that most people expected them to be met. Plus, a lot of people who'd been living in that area for 20 or 30 years were just, they were losing their home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are the things that happen every day. 
Yeah, um, that definitely shaped my approach to to the work at a very early stage. And, and I think you've done this. Are there other insights that you'd want to share from your experience in fundraising and program design that could specifically help women and small business owners improve their own strategies? I think authenticity does matter even more now than ever. And people tend to try to meet the need of the investor or meet the need of the donor, um, which right, like I've done my fair share of that. And yet at the same time, it didn't always feel good. And I don't know that I was actually being helpful um, in the long run. So I'll give an example. I was uh, doing fundraising with the school and was looking at our proposals and it was very deficit framed, like the, the language and the proposal was, you know, talking about at risk youth and, you know, communities that were blighted and all this other kind of stuff. And it wasn't contextualizing how it got that way, right? Like, even if we assume that this is true, people don't choose, <laughs> right, like to exist in certain conditions. So there was some framing that wasn't, I thought, accurate. I, th I thought this was for a lot, it's going to sound crass, but I thought this was poverty pimping. And I was like, I don't, I don't, as a fundraiser, want to be a part of this ongoing narrative. So this has to change. So I actually was very intentional about changing the language and the framing that I was using in proposals, because I didn't want to continue perpetuating this view of Black children and Black communities, because it was predominantly Black, to white donors. That was sort of a a moment where I, I had to understand like what my, <laughs> not just my point of view, but what was driving my commitment to doing the work in the first place. And it had to be a part, this had to be a part of it. And so um, the authenticity with which we do our work actually does matter. And I understand, you know, sometimes you do, you've got to move, right? Like there's, you can't just be rigid and, and there's, you know, like I'm not changing off of these things, but there has to be some nugget or something that is held sacred that regardless of the, the resources or regardless of, you know, who or how folks are approaching it that you hold at the center, either as a fundraiser, as an entrepreneur, founder, whatever, that you, you know, you're not going to move off of that thing or you will defend that thing. That's the, that's the authentic nugget that is core to you as an individual, but also to what it is that you've created. Um, and so getting really clear about what that thing is and protecting it. I love that. Not that you need me to add anything. I can't add anything. It's so, so, so well said. And I'm just, I think it's such great, great insight. So today you're CEO of ReAventures. Can you talk to the audience a little bit about how that came about first and then, and then we'll go from there? Very randomly, actually. Um, so I am very often say accidental entrepreneur and an accidental CEO to a, to a degree. Of course, I had to apply for the position and they, there was intention there. But it's not because I saw a thing and I was like, oh, let me go for that. So if I back up just a little bit um, to 2020, during which I was a fellow with the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation, um, running the Equitable Access to Capital Markets program. And the intentions of that program were to basically promote engagement of um, diverse managers in different spaces, right? So looking at different types of institutional investors and encouraging them to develop strategies that would actually um, source and, and hire managers. And the approach was going to require me to be in spaces, but then the pandemic happened. And so we shifted, shifted the, the program to focus more on blogs and webinars. The first webinar that I released, I mean, the first blog, sorry, that I released was, uh, I think it was titled, The Racism in the Room Made Visible by COVID-19. Hiding in plain sight, the racism in the room made visible by COVID-19. It was talking about right, like how what we were seeing um, happening in society that was actually being discussed and surfaced. And that was released maybe a week or two before George Floyd's murder. So the racial reckoning that followed started to shift the gaze, shift the lens to capital. All right. Like all of a sudden there were these questions about 
wait, well, why are communities looking this way? Why, right? So my work was, was front and center. And for that entire year, I don't know that there was a week where I wasn't on somebody's webinar or doing some media interview or having a conversation about racism and capital markets and, you know, thinking about racial equity and impact investing and different strategies, et cetera. And so in that, visibility. I was uh, on a webinar or so cap, I don't know, maybe in October. And I was asked for a mu- an introduction by a mutual friend to the board chair of RIA. And so the lesson learned here, <laughs> you, never, you never know watching. who's watching. <laughs> you never know who's watching. Yeah. But um, again, that was always my passion. That was that was my nugget. That was the sacred thing. And I, I've been doing that for years, like 10 years, uh, saying the same thing for 10 years, but all of a sudden it, it, it was platform. Formed, basically. Um, and so was asked to apply for this position because I had a view not just on reproductive maternal health. I actually didn't have any background in that. My background or the work I've been doing is at racial equity and impact investing. Um, and so that experience was what the CEO and the board thought was needed for the organization because we're a hybrid, right? Like we're a nonprofit organization that owns a venture fund. Um, and that venture fund, which sits under uh, Reaventures is making those investments, but it's tied into a larger strategy. And so the skills and the experience and the point of view that I had was quite applicable. And, you know, they were supportive, they being the board, like you can hire for some of this technical expertise. But this mashup <laughs> right, like of, of experience and of perspective and understanding is rare to find. And that's what we need within the organization. So that's how I became CEO. It's amazing to me to think that it took such tragic events to move America generally to where you you have been and many women have been and, and many people of color have been for a really long time seeing these issues and talking about them. And that's just very striking to me. Rhea Ventures, can you tell listeners a little bit about what you invest in, what your typical type of uh, entrepreneurs that you might be looking for, typical deal size, that sort of thing? Sure. So RH Capital's investment thesis is focused on basically four pillars. There's systemic change, there's affordability, there's sort of transforming the market, and access. I think it was access is, is how we frame those. Um, so basically, when we're looking at companies, and again, it's it tends to be early and growth stage companies, so seed, Series A, um, so you know, not necessarily profitable yet, or you know, research is sort of moving out of the, or the opportunity is moving out of research and um, into commercial viability. That's sort of the stage of of companies that we're looking at. Um, from there. As a subsidiary of a nonprofit, the initial screen for companies is one around impact, right? Like, is it supporting our impact thesis? And does it have the potential to, to impact um, health equity outcomes as well? So in reproductive and maternal health, as with so many other um, areas uh, in uh, health and, and other I will say uh, life outcomes, there are disparities <laughs> in access and disparities in, in health outcomes. Um, so, uh, for example, the maternal health crisis, is, it is a crisis for Black women and getting worse. So the way that we look at um, companies is through that lens as well, um, and not necessarily to determine whether or not a company comes in or out of a portfolio really like what is possible <laughs> with this this company so there's both a financial um, a diligence and view because we are market rate return fund but that impact first lens gives us an understanding of how can this actually be transformative with respect to women's reproductive and maternal health and what would you say of the investments that Ria has made is there one that that stands out to you that that has made a measurable impact in a community which I also realize it's a hard question to answer also because like you're investing in really early stage companies. And so they may not yes. have a track <laughs> record yet. I, I realize that. Exactly. So some of it is really looking at, again, uh, those that are in the market, like Kayaba or May Nurex, which was moving into the U.S. market as an online um, pharmacy, like that are actually functioning in the in the market. Um, and so May, which is focused on access to doulas and uh, maternal health outcomes for black women, 
Kayab, a similarly situated, um, it's more of a, a place-based uh, model that is uh, leveraging uh, health navigators um, to support improved maternal health outcomes in place in Philadelphia was where that one was established. So those are, I think, exciting because they're so focused <laughs> um, and unapologetic in the the work and the approach that they're taking. Companies, I'm trying to think of, and no, there's no favorite, right? Like there's, you, you can't have, it's like, oh, I love all my children equally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so those are examples of ones that are super focused on addressing uh, health outcomes. Correct me if I'm wrong, you also invest in sex health as well. Products? We don't have any in our in our portfolio right now, and that's still an emergent field and space. Um, and I think there are other women's health funds that are making um, investments in sexual health, um, but there are none that are in our portfolio just yet. Okay. I will say this. At the time that RIA was established, there really weren't a lot of women's health-focused funds either. So to see the growth of the sector where you're seeing more funds and you're seeing other types of funds entering this market is actually pretty significant because we were very focused on contraception and abortion care access initially. Most of what's in our portfolio was contraception. So whether it's contraceptive technologies or access, that was sort of the core initially. But it's a much more expanded portfolio of companies that you'll see right now. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about for listeners, you, you said that there is a crisis in healthcare for Black women. Can you talk to that a little bit more so that so that listeners understand why it is at a crisis point? Uh, the why is varied, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, medical racism, where there have just always been, if we understand the history even of gynecology and obstetrics in our country, that Black women's bodies were basically being used for scientific experimentation. And so there's a level of dismissiveness, disrespect, um, and cruelty, quite frankly, that is in the roots of this country's relationship to uh, reproductive health care. Um, and so that doesn't happen by mistake, and it doesn't go away overnight. Um, and so a lot of the, the attitudes um, towards Black women and their health care have been embedded in medicine over time. And so you see a lot of uh, what's called medical racism. You see a lot of bias um, in terms of the treatment of Black women and their pain. I think there were very high profile conversations about this when um, Beyonce and Serena Williams told their stories about not being believed. These are two women who are not just at the top of their, their professions, physically peak condition. Yes. If anyone would know what is going on in their bodies, it is women who rely on their bodies, right, um, as their profession. And so it sounded very odd, but <laughs> no, no. Um, but but the idea that they wouldn't be believed by their caregivers, who ostensibly are, you know, probably some of the among the best in the world, just gives you an indication of what anyone else could expect, right? And so when then looking at the outcomes, Black maternal health outcomes in terms of morbidity, and mortality, uh, where Black women are dying at um, significantly higher rates uh, than white women. And it's already bad in our country when you look at developed countries with respect to deaths per, per 100,000 births. And so women's deaths, maternal deaths per 100,000 births. So it's actually dangerous to be a Black woman and to carry a pregnancy to term and have a baby. And so that's embedded. <laughs> um, and so to be able to undo that, one, you have to see it. You have to see it. You have to name it um, and understand that root cause, like that this didn't just pop up in the last five years or 10 years. This has been happening over decades, if not centuries, as long as we've been in this country and have to want to alleviate suffering, right? You have to want to actually deal with the humanity of this or the inhumanity of it um, from a place of this has to change, right? Like we can't allow this um, to to be the conditions under which people are, are going through what should be a natural part of, of life, right? So I think having this understanding of the historic context is so important. <laughs> um, not that we can change what's happened in history, but that's where it comes from. And if we don't understand that, then we don't take the right interventions to, to do something different. I'm kind of ashamed to admit this, but the first time I really understood, at least in intellectually, what you're referring to was when I read a, a 
book called The Immortal uh, Life of Henrietta Lacks, who I'm sure, as you know, is a woman who I believe had either I think cervical or uterine cancer and kept going to the doctor, I think, to Johns Hopkins. And she was not a woman of means. And they kept telling her, sending her back and telling her there was nothing wrong with her. And then she died of cancer. And they also, I'm just going to say the institution, because I don't really know who that they were exactly, but they, they realized that her cells could replicate. And I don't quite understand the science behind that, but they basically now call them HeLa cells for Henrietta Lacks. They're used today and they've been used to help a myriad of healthcare discoveries. And her family was never compensated. She was never asked for consent. There were so many things that were raised by this book. And that's just what what you're talking about reminds me of is how long it's been going on, right? Yeah. The book that I was referencing is called uh, Medical Bondage, and it looks at the history of American gynecology written by um, Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens and really digs into the story of uh, the the system that um, enabled uh, James Marion Sims to become the father of gynecology. Uh, but she talks about the mothers of gynecology and these women who were not only patients and operated on against their consent. They couldn't consent because they were enslaved uh, Black women and without anesthesia because it was believed that Black women didn't feel pain the same way that white women did. And then forced not only to be operated on this way, but also to support and care for each other, uh, but also expected to continue to function uh, (laughs) um, in in the ways that um, enslaved women were expected to, to function. And so a point of view that would see that as okay. Um, again, that that doesn't happen overnight, and it was accepted. It was seen as acceptable, and that's what established. Those are the roots of the of American gynecology, and so those are the types of stories and understandings that we have to have, so that we're not repeating those patterns, right? Um, because he became wealthy. <laughs> You know, his innovations in, in surgery and the the tools that he was creating at that time, he became wealthy, he established a, a reputation and became a, a medical lead, right? Like all of these things that went along with it. But at what cost was that enabled? And if we're not clear about that, we will repeat those. So those patterns get repeated all the time, uh, quite frankly. And so when we're, you know, thinking about innovation for the sake of innovation, but not wait, like, let's push pause and say, who's going to benefit from this innovation? Yes. Not just materially in in terms of the financially, but health wise. And who's informing this, this innovation? And how are we, um, you know, thinking about this in the marketplace? And uh, so, so many questions that can go into the process that very often are overlooked and not understood as, again, replicating what's happened before. So, yes, that's powerful and thought provoking. So, with that in mind, for people who are listening, today, what actionable tips can you give to entrepreneurs or or women who just want to help drive innovation, access, and equity in their own industries? Um, That's a great question. Um, And I'm glad that you used the word equity um, (laughs) in that because that does require deeper understanding of what's shaping uh, the outcomes that are happening in that industry. So regardless of uh, who you are and where you're entering this work, I believe we should be thinking about solidarity. I don't have to have your experience to want to support you in in advancing uh, better outcomes for the community that you may represent. And so I think everyone has role to play and being intentional about solidarity and thinking about who's being harmed or who has been harmed with respect to the problem that I'm trying to resolve with this innovation. Um, And so being very intentional about going to the margins to understand if I design a thing for who exists at the margins, everyone else is going to actually benefit. If I design for the margins, then I will absolutely address all the other problems that are happening along the way, because you're basically broadening your aperture, right? And so if your aperture is really closed and focused on the very small group, 
then there's people that you're just not seeing. But if you intentionally broaden that aperture so that you're seeing who has been ignored or who's been rendered invisible in the past, your solution is going to, by by virtue of doing that, encompass everyone else in the in the middle. And so being intentional about doing that work, I think, is incredibly important. And yes, it takes time. Yes, you have to be intentional. Yes, it requires effort. But I think once you recognize that that's not been what's going on, you choose as a choice, right? Will I advance what is status quo or will I take a different path and, and advance a different set of outcomes in a different world? And the outcomes that you're talking about when you talk about a different aperture, the product or service itself will be better because it's really being informed. By <laughs> it. It, it just, yes. when, when thought of in that way, it's such a no brainer and kind of remarkable that it, it still goes on today. That it, that it doesn't happen. Yeah. So there's a, the curb cut effect is, is what I referenced. Great article also about it. What is it called? Sorry? It's called the curb cut effect. Okay. So when we have a universal goal, what are the targeted interventions or the targeted strategies so that everyone can get to that goal? If health is the goal, <laughs> what are the targeted strategies that different communities need um, to be able to get to that. And so just accounting for the ways in which groups are situated differently when we're when we're aiming for a particular uh, goal. How do you incorporate a racial equity lens in practice? I mean, like in your day-to-day practice, what does that look like? So I've been fortunate enough to be around some amazing practitioners, some amazing researchers, thought leaders, decision makers, like all kinds of Mm -hmm. folks from different perspectives who do think about this all the time. And so, you know, been able to read some interesting books and be part of different conversations and processes. And one of the things that I, I had developed over time from that to help decision makers apply racial equity lens as an actual framework so that you're thinking not just in terms of the result, but you have to think about the process, right? Um, So if my aspiration is to have more equitable outcomes with respect to manager diversity, that's something I've been spending a lot of time on, then what is it that I do every day? What's informing? What are the data points that I'm using? What's my actual commitment to this? <laughs> like, the, What is the degree to which I understand what I'm seeing? What are my policies telling me to do, right? Like when I am looking for right, like the authority or the, uh, the guidance, what are my policies shaped to do? Are they race explicit? Are they at least race informed? What is the, the data that I'm using? And even thinking deeply about data, right? Like who owns it, who's shaping it, right? All these different questions in that regard as well. Is it disaggregated in a way that I actually understand um, how different groups are faring with respect to my decision or this area of work that I'm focused on? Who has been involved in this, right? Who is involved in the decision making and how is that informing strategy? Is there an authentic representative voice um, or am I making stuff up? (laughs) <laughs> because, because I, you know, I just, I just am. I, I want to do a thing, and and I haven't heard from people who live closest to the problem um, and how they're experiencing it and what they would tell me to do. And am I willing to even shift uh, a little bit of that power, that decision making? So, um, those are just some of the, I guess, the reflection questions um, uh, in a process. I also think about narrative. I like back to that uh, story I was telling earlier, but what's the narrative that's shaping this understanding? Is it is it an asset frame or a deficit frame? Is it explaining, you're rightly using systems to explain the outcomes? Because um, it's very easy to say, well, there's a disparity, but it's because of individual behavior. Individual behavior right. is driven or by circumstances. And when you, <laughs> right, exactly. And yeah. so, right, like these are all the kinds of questions that I'm kind of running through and that are looking at when applying that lens to, to decision making. And you said you have a framework that you have in place. And so for anyone who wants to, to learn about that framework, how can they do so? Sure. So there is one framework actually on our website at Reaventures. It's called the Heart Framework, um, and it is based on the the real framework. But it's a way of thinking about decision making through a health equity lens. And so um, you can actually go to our website and find that. I'm just a click on the Heart Framework, and that's an excellent tool for again thinking about 
the company level. Um, and then we also have resources for investors uh, for their due diligence process. So that's all available. Or um, you can go to racialequityassetlab.org. And uh, we're actually, I'm just about to update that site where you'd be able to download the framework directly, but can reach out to get access to the framework. And the lab is obviously a lot of people have been involved in it, but that is your baby, right? You create. Is, it is. Yes. Mm-hmm. That was in 2018. Okay. And were you at that point working with companies who expressed an interest in, and I know there are so many companies that do express an interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then actually think they're doing the thing, but don't measure it, or it's just kind of performatory rather than actually caring, right? So what was it like in 2018 and what is it like now? Is there a difference, generally speaking? I think there is a difference, just the level of conversation. And I think the baseline has shifted a bit. Um, So in 2018, when I established it, it was because I had finished my work at the Association of Black Foundation Executives, which is where I did a lot of uh, engagement with foundations on endowment management practices. And then it's been about just shy of two years at a community foundation, uh, the Baltimore Community Foundation. And so the conversations about racial equity and impact investing were still not happening at a large scale. So there are a bunch of conferences and convenings that happen in this space, and really it still wasn't being talked about. And my point of view is that we cannot actually talk about impact at the E, the S or the G, at the environmental, the social, or the governance, unless we are also talking about inequity and talking about racial equity, because that's where the deepest disparities exist. Bar none, right? Like (laughs) it was designed that way. Um, And so if we're not having those conversations, then we're not really going to have deep impact. And so I created it to start to think about having those conversations and who wanted to be part of those conversations, not the surface level. We have a, you know, our policy so we don't get in trouble with the federal government level, but actual interest and deep commitment. Um, And so that's how it how it got started. The environment in 2018 still was, it wasn't a hostile one, but it wasn't a reflective environment where people would actually see these words and be like, hmm, you know what, we actually maybe need to think about that. It was, whoa, do we need to talk about it? Like, you use the race word, you use, the, <laughs> right? Like the, those words are going to put people on edge. So post-2020, There's a lot more familiarity and I think a little bit more comfort with the language. There's more expectation regarding data. That wasn't the case in 2018, where people are now asking, like, who's in my portfolio? Who who owns the asset management firms that are running my money right now? And I want to see what that workforce looks like. And I want to actually engage more uh, diverse managers, but I won't know unless I know what's already in my portfolio. So that's becoming baseline. Um, so that is difference. The fact that it's on every agenda. You can't go to a conference where there's not at least one workshop or a theme, right? Like that is tied to to racial equity. Um, so the the dialogue is there. We still have a ways to go on the action, <laughs> but I think those would be the biggest things. The action is is following, but not as fast as as it needs to. Not as fast or as deep, yeah. Yeah, as deep. Yeah, that that is also true. There's a lot of very surface level. What tips would you give to women and minority entrepreneurs who are facing racial inequity barriers and seeking opportunities in the venture capital space? So the one thing I would say first and foremost is that venture capital is not the space for everyone. Um, And so that doesn't mean don't pursue VC funding. Not at all, right? Like if this is the right type of funding for you, go for it. Just be clear that that's the right type of funding um, that you want to pursue for your company. You've got to give up equity and there are very high expectations of return. Um, And so if scale is not what you're interested in doing, um, then think twice about pursuing um, VC. That said, if that is of interest to you, try to find the the funds that are more aligned with your values. Um, Start there uh, because you'll get more support. There will be more of a conversation about that sacred thing (laughs) um, uh, and how to support that and support you as an individual. Um, So there are VCs that are out here and other uh, private investments that are 
impact. They have an impact thesis. And so that's not to say that every woman and person of color who's starting a company or who's seeking that funding is doing it for impact. What I'm suggesting is if out of your lived experience, you've created a thing and there is, again, that sacred piece of it, the impact funds may be a better first option than you know, like kind of getting out here and right. you know, just being out in the world with people who don't know and don't care to know. That would be like first step um, that I would recommend. Connect with some of the the incubators and the accelerators um, that are out here. There are the, those that are designed for women. Um, women of color, people of color. So uh, make sure that you're connected to those and thinking of like new voices. Um, Foundation is an example of one. And build those networks. Um, I would also say, you know, I think crowdfunding gets a bad rap sometimes, but there are platforms out here that can link uh, opportunities for community investment uh, to founders. And so sort of seek those out as well, because that is, I think, also uh, an overlooked opportunity. So we talk about the friends and family. Sometimes you got to have a more expansive view of friends and family and how to incorporate that as well. So those are just some of the, I think, basic recommendations. It's a great thing that you're that you're saying because um, you remind me of uh, two women of color who who've been on my show twice and they're coming on. I hope for a third time, and they raised venture capital in an oversubscribed round. But one of the things that they said that was just inherently kind of, I think, in their words, racist about the process was the notion that they had friends and family that could afford to put that kind of money into a venture and lose it potentially. And that was, that was really eye opening and so true. Thank you for mentioning the crowdfunding because it is a, a good way to spread the risk and potentially benefit even more people. Yes. Um, and you can have more participation that way. You started off talking about the racial wealth gap because of that people don't have friends and family to the point that can invest and afford to lose that investment um, at the earliest stages of, of a company. And so the very idea of um, who has made this, these investments on the front end or who's supporting this founder on the front end, it's sort of being an indication of commitment is inherently racist because we have a system that did not allow for people to build wealth, right? Like they accumulate wealth through through redlining and other means. Yes. That's why history is so important. That's why you have to know, <laughs> right? Because that's the context. Um, and so if we don't have a, a sense of, of racial history and an understanding of that, then we don't know why things are the way they are. And that's what I mean about, you know, you may encounter people who don't know, <laughs> don't want to know, um, right? Like just don't care to know. And so you're not going to get a good audience with those those types of folks. Again, do what's necessary to get your thing. My last question is, how do you deal with the people that don't want to hear the message? That is a great question. And maybe I have designed my life in a way that I try not to have <laughs> interaction with them. Because this goes to your um, your earlier question about like why maternal health outcomes, Black women's maternal health outcomes are what they are. Because of racism, it's stressful. Like It is a, a stressful a system to have to exist in and have to deal with. And so um, the degree to which you can create protective factors and not actually have to have interaction with folks like that matters. Now, I know that's not realistic, right? Like to say that you're not going to have to deal with folks like that. But I think being able to recognize it when it's happening, and that's where some of those people call it self-care and I don't know if that's the, even the right term for it, but you have to figure out how to create the distance between what is a very personal experience, like a lived experience, and dealing with someone for whom like they that may not be clear, right? Like that you don't even know what you're saying because you don't have a sense of, again, that history or root cause analysis or what's the systemic drivers of this particular outcome. So because it's finance, you almost can't avoid having to have interactions with these folks, but, you know, remaining focused and then even finding again, those opportunities that are aligned at the intersection of values can help with that. So it's not a perfect answer um, and it may not even be a helpful one, but there is that, that balance between absolutely trying to stay whole, but still trying to get your, your, your product um, to, to market and out in the world. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, we all have to, 
like sustain ourselves in some way. And if, and I know exactly what you mean, the balance between the fight and the inequity and yeah, what do we call it? Self-care. Um, it, it's hard, right? It's hard to even know the words to use to just stay afloat. I want to thank you for your honesty in talking about these issues and in educating me and my audience, not my audience, the audience. And I've, I've really benefited from speaking with you. And before you tell listeners where we can find out more about Reaventures, if there's one thing that anyone can do in 2023 to make an impact, what would that be? And racial inequity, let me be specific. That is a really, really hard question to answer because it depends where you're coming into the yeah in the context the effort right I like realize. where you are on on the journey um and for some people, it is just get a book read, <laughs> read right like read the color of law or read race for profit or read something that is going to enlighten you <laughs> um, on these issues. Um, uh, Dorothy Roberts, uh, Killing the Black Body, excellent book for understanding sort of the injustice um, in terms of Black women's uh, reproductive health. Like over time, it's a great book for, for really um, deepening an understanding of how policy has shaped uh, health outcomes for Black women as well. So just educate yourself so that your perspective is, is broader and different. That's one place um, for folks to, to enter, but you can't stop there, right? Like you then actually have to take that and understand how to apply that learning to, to decision-making or to resource allocation, right? So do something that's going to inform your point of view to action, I think, not necessarily just for the sake of gaining information. Like it only matters if it shifts into impacting what you do. So yes, action. I think it's a very underused word and a really important one. So where can listeners find out more about Rhea Ventures or if they would like to contact you, how would they do so? Sure. So you can find us at uh, Rhea Ventures, R-H-I-A Ventures.org, um, where that's where you can access the heart framework, some of our corporate engagement and shareholder advocacy resources, our database on company statements, public statements regarding abortion care access. Uh, so please, by all means, uh, check out our website and all those many resources that we have there. And I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, so if you look up Erica Seth Davies, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think my email might be on the website. I'm slow on email, I can tell you that. But <laughs> um, Erica at Reaventures <laughs> is where is my email address. And that's where folks can find me. Thank you for, for all the work that you're spearheading. And I look forward to keeping an eye on, on everything and making my own small impact as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here um, and continue to lift up all these different stories on your platform. It's so needed. You've been listening to She Ventures. Like what you heard? You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and sign up for our newsletter so you never miss a show.